Hello, uh, I am Steve Robbins, and I am here with Stephen Sashin, the founder and president of Zero Shoes. Welcome, Stephen. Well, first of all, thank you. And secondly, I have a new title. Um, I've been recently retitled as Chief Barefoot Officer. Ch wow. Okay, barefoot is suddenly a theme here. Um, uh, as I was mentioning to you prior, uh, uh, prior to us going on air, uh, part of what brought you to mind is that I did a show with uh, Greg Stern, who he's a physiotherapist, and his title was, you know, Why I Go Barefoot everywhere and he mentioned zero shoes which got me thinking of you and you know yada 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 so your chief bear are you barefoot right now wait hold on uh, 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 just to prove it yep oh all right yeah Let's so say, for those wait, watching wait, wait. i'm barefoot so often in so many places but if i wear shoes they're always mismatched colors so people notice and i was in the pharmacy line at costco a little while ago and the guy behind me says hey your shoes don't match and the pharmacist without even looking up or missing a beat says he's wearing shoes <laughs> well so that's going to tie in i'm sure to the zero shoes story itself uh and yeah. barefoot but let's start off with me asking we first met like a long time ago now like 16 17 years maybe 20. I was going to say it was about twenty years ago. Yeah. Wow. And we then we basically, children. we were we were we were babies, embryonic, um, <laughs> and then uh, I, we lost touch or or just fell out of touch, and yeah. then um, several years later, like two decades later, I was buying a pair of shoes, and I had had someone tell me like, "Oh, you should get the kind of shoes that don't have a lot of cushioning, that are like barefoot, and it will help your balance and all kinds of things." And I went and bought a pair of zero shoes. And um, much to my extreme surprise, your picture was on the website. <laughs> um, how did that happen? How did you go from being an embryonic, meek, mild-mannered, whatever it was that you used to do, <laughs> yeah. to... Um... Uh, never, never meek nor mild-mannered, but regardless. Uh, what happened is uh, 17 years ago, when I was 45, I got back into sprinting after a 30-year break, and I spent the next two years getting injured pretty much constantly. And a friend of mine, um, who is a world champion uh, cross country runner, which, by the way, when I was living in Boulder, Colorado, saying world champion runner is another way of saying my neighbor because they're everywhere. In fact, I'm the out of all the people that I that I train with, I'm the only one who doesn't have a world championship title of some sort. So anyway, he suggested wow. that I try running barefoot to see if I learned anything and handed me a copy of the book Born to Run, which is about the Tatarmara Indians who run in these sandals made out of scraps of tire, uh, laced their foot with a strap of leather. And they, you know, some of the most amazing runners in the world up until their 60s, 70s and beyond. I mean, they just spend a lot of time running. In fact, one of the nicknames for them is the running people. So um, I decided to try this barefoot thing for the fun of it. And here and I'm not suggesting other people do this, but I'll say this running barefoot good form feels good bad form hurts it's the bottom line and i uh was in pain actually i wasn't in pain at first what happened was I, so i'm a sprinter i run the 100 meters outdoors i run the 60 meters indoors i don't take turns around the track because i don't have a gps watch and i don't like getting lost so i have <laughs> never never run more than about a mile in my entire life and i never enjoyed anything after the first you know 200 meters of it so this first barefoot run, it's a bunch of us. We are uh, running on roads and on grass and on uh, trails and over wooden bridges. I mean, everything you could think of, every surface you could imagine. And I was so transfixed with the experience um, of feeling my feet on the ground and experimenting with my gait. What happens if I run faster, run slower? What if I run the same speed but move my legs faster or slower? What if I land on this part of my foot or that part of my foot? At the end of this thing... Um, I had uh, someone had a GPS watch on and I said, how far did we just go? And she said, a little over 5K. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? And I could have kept going, but we all just decided as a group to stop. I ended up with a big blister on the ball of my left foot. And it occurred to me um, that my right foot was fine, which is an upside down way that most people think of these things. Most people go, oh, I got a blister. See, this is nonsense. But I'm going, how come my right leg is fine? And by the way, my left leg gets injured more often. So the second barefoot run, I got a gaping hole in the ball of my left foot. And I'm figuring if I can find a way to run that doesn't hurt, then I'm probably not doing the thing that caused the gaping hole. So let me give it 10 minutes. If it doesn't work, you know, no harm, no foul. Nine minutes and 30 seconds of pain later, <laughs> um, it just changed instantly. And because basically I was paying attention to the good leg to see what it was doing. And then the, the quote, bad leg figured it out. My brain just, you know, realized if I'm going to keep doing this thing, 
it better find a way to make it not unpleasant. And my running got faster, easier, lighter. Uh, what I had discovered, and I didn't know it at the time, but I figured it out, is that I had previously been overstriding, reaching my foot too far out in front of my center of mass, more with my left foot than my right. And as a sprinter, want to land on the ball of your foot, pointing my toes. So every time I'm hitting the ball of my foot, I'm basically putting the brakes on and creating that excessive horizontal force, AKA friction. That's what caused the blister. And then it went away. So that experience was really profound. Again, I couldn't feel the problem when I was in a regular shoe with all this cushioning and padding, et cetera. It was only barefoot that I could feel it. But the kick is my injuries went away. I became faster. For the last 15 years, I've been a master's all-American sprinter. So for men in my age group, I've been like one of the top 20 fastest guys in the country ever since. And I wanted that barefoot experience as much as I could have it, but I wanted to not have to argue with restaurants about whether it was legal to go in there in bare feet. And my wife was tired of me coming home with my dirty ass bare feet and walking into our white carpeted house. So we're- I can really relate to that as someone with a white <laughs> carpet. <laughs> There you go. So we're, we're close to the end. So I decided to, I found a, a way of making a pair of sandals like the Tatar wear, but just simpler, just, you know, some rubber that I got from a shoe repair place, some cord from Home Depot, lacing system that I kind of modified from something I found online. And I started making these for other people and they told two friends and they told two friends. And one day uh, a guy says, <clears throat> I've got a book coming out on barefoot running. And if you treated this sandal making hobby of yours like a business and had a website, I could put you in the book. So I've been an internet marketer since 1992. I'd built hundreds and hundreds of websites. I rushed home, pitched this incredible opportunity to my wife who insisted that it was a really stupid idea, wouldn't make any money and insisted that I not do it. So I, I told her that I wouldn't and then she went to bed and I did. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and she kind of growled at me uh, but the next morning, but I said, you know, we had started a search engine marketing business at that time. And I said, it'll be a great case study. Um, I can, I think I can own all the keywords that I care about in about three months. And I was completely wrong. It only took me six weeks. And what we thought might be a car payment, uh, instantly it was obvious this was going to be our life. And that was 14 and a half years ago. And here we are. Wow. Okay. So, so uh, there's a whole bunch of things I want to ask about. Some of them about the business, some of them about the website and, and, uh, uh, and some of them about the learning that, that you initially did with, you know, looking at the or paying attention to the foot that was that was working as opposed to the one that was blistered. Um, yeah. Boy. OK, hang on a second. I, I'm stop, Steve, or compose yourself. All right. First, I'm going to start with the foot, because I, I think you very correctly pointed out. You said you did something different than what most people would do. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of Feldenkrais, uh, Moshe Feldenkrais. Oh, well, uh, I have. And that what I described is a Feldenkrais principle. In fact, here, I don't know how far back you go in Feldenkrais, but I'm going to name drop. Um, do you know Tom Please. Hanna, who wrote Somatics? I, I don't. He's the guy who brought Moshe Feldenkrais to America. And um, I met him, oh boy, back in 1989. Um, and he did some cool things to my body that really made my brain explode. When you were two. Okay. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Right after my second birthday, I met Tom. He came, he was a clown. He came and performed my birthday party. <laughs> right. um, so for those people who don't know the principle, uh, by, by uh, Feldenkrais would work with half of someone's body and then, and then the other half of their body would end up mirroring the work that was done, which well, and to be clear, it's usually the right half or the left half. And it's usually not that if you walk in saying, hey, my left shoulder hurts, they're going to work on your right shoulder and make sure that it's, you know, knowing how to move correctly in in harmony with the rest of the right side of your body. And then when you switch to the quote bad side, um, there is just information that crosses the corpus callosum and makes that makes the learning of that new movement pattern or that original movement pattern that is no longer restricted uh, much easier. So so then the attention that you're paying you're you're paying attention to the left side or whichever whichever side you just said because i'm looking at you and, and you're mirrored and yeah i was paying attention to the right side okay yeah well, see look i can i can do that here right so so you were paying attention to the right side which was the side that was that was functional and it informed the left side and you applied that Correct. same principle to what was uh to what was happening in your in your sprints Correct. um so i'm gonna actually take a gigantic leap here and cross domains and say is that also a principle you've applied in the business itself? Because it's it a principle I applied like... to. It's a principle that I've applied to everything I've ever done, which is basically looking at. It, there's two parts to it. One is kind of looking and seeing what everyone's doing and trying to find the common factors 
that actually make it work rather than what people say makes it work. Um, and the other is looking to see if there's some counterfactual, some other cause for the results that people are describing that may be true. Basically looking to see if something, whatever it is, is full of shit. I mean, I just, I, I have a fondness for just, I, for looking, I don't know what it is, for just kind of hearing when something is off is the best way I can put it. You'll appreciate this one. It, this happened back in, oh yeah, yeah, when Lane and I first got together, so like 25 years ago or so. Um, I was, we were visiting a friend and somehow uh, something got published. It was a study, ostensibly a study, that said they looked at the class of 1954 from Princeton and looked at them 20 years later. And there was like one group, the top 3% were more successful than the other 97% combined. And the only difference between the two groups is that top 3% wrote down their goals. And for some reason, I just went, that's eh, bullshit. And I actually did something fun. I made a, I did this massive spreadsheet to figure out what the odds are that that would have happened just statistically, just for no reason. Like, you know, cause the Sultan of somewhere's son was happened to be in that Princeton class and he had more money than everyone the day he walked in. And, right. and, um, and then I, I called a friend of mine who's a big deal therapist and personal development guy and said, you know, you told me this story too, but you said it was like the 1963 class from Harvard. Have you actually seen the study? And he said, no. I said, oh, then it didn't happen. And he, so I got online. I don't remember how I did this because this is the early days of the internet. But somehow I posted somewhere that I would pay $1,000 to anyone who could give me the study. And I'd also pay $1,000 to anyone who could prove that it didn't happen, even though I know you can't really prove the non-existence of something. And right. five minutes later, I get an email from the guy who founded Snopes saying, here's an article from Fast Company Magazine where they researched this story and found that it's completely not true. And I replied back, wow, you did that so easily. I have to admit, I feel a little uncomfortable about giving you a thousand bucks. He said, well, I wasn't expecting you to give me anything. I said, cool, then here's $500, enjoy. <laughs> so that was kind of like that and some things that I had been investigating in the personal development and meditation world, kind of just something snapped in my brain where I've just got a really good nose, ear, eye, something for hearing when something's just a little out of whack and then trying to find out what it is. That was a much longer answer than I planned to give to your simple question. Yes. So, well, so I want to relate that back to both your foot and to, uh, uh, you know, and then to business. So, so, well, well, let me here, let me jump in with the business one. Whenever someone said, whenever someone approaches me to get my money for doing something to help my business and they say, we're going to employ best practices, I go, yeah, then I'm not going to hire you. Because by the time something is best practices, it's either on the way out or it never really worked to begin with, but everyone adopted it because they, there's following the leader or jumping off the cliff, you know, with the other who's the, what sees the jump off cliffs. Um, so, uh, and of course our entire business is based on that. It's based on the, the simple idea that modern footwear causes the problems that they're claiming to cure, or at least doesn't cure the problems they claim to cure, but actually does cause them. And by, getting out of the way, doing the opposite of what every major footwear company has been doing for 50 years, that is the answer. And I mean, so that is the foundation of our entire business. And as we get further into different aspects of the business, product development, marketing, all of that. Same thing, Quick, um, another quick story. When we started making closed toed shoes, which we didn't do until 20, the end of 2016, after we've been in business for five and a half years, or um, um, wait, uh, whatever it was, almost seven years actually. Um, we approached a rubber manufacturer and said, here's the, actually, well, anyway, we approached a rubber manufacturer at some point and said, here's the characteristics we want for our product. And it's got to be durable. It's got to be flexible. It's got to have all these other qualities. And the rubber manufacturer said, but that's not how they make outsoles for shoes. And we said, yeah, no shit. That's why we're going to do it this way because we're going to do it the right way. And so from product development through marketing to even accounting, frankly, we're having to, we're looking at things differently than the status quo a because the status quo is often wrong and b because we're do everything we do is different than what anyone else is doing so it's interesting that you say that because there's the two words immediately come to mind right one of them is contrarian like you 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 person you're just being a contrarian about things um and the second is yeah and that seems to really be working for you well so, I, I wouldn't say contrarian because a contrarian is someone who just takes the opposite position just to take the opposite position. 
we have the good, the great good fortune that the opposite position is true. <laughs> I mean, it's not that I'm, we're trying to be contrary. And again, it's like if you really take a deep dive and look at the things that people believe and look at the things that they think are true and just check in whatever way you can, then you might find that things aren't what they seem. <clears throat> I mean, a simple example that applies to everyone in the planet pretty much is we all, A, want to be happy. We want to predict what it's going to take to make us happy in the future. We're horrible at predicting it. The only thing we're worse at is remembering how bad we are at it. And, um, and then we think we're special because if we met a million people who got the thing that we think it takes to be happy and found out they're no happier than they were before they got it, or they're not even happier than we are right now, we'd still go, yeah, but if I got it, I mean, I know all those lottery winners are no happier, but if I won the lottery. And so, um, you know, that's just another piece of it as well. It's just being, it, it's, so one thing I, I actually was interviewed by uh, some somebody at Princeton, I don't know, that's why I brought up Princeton before, who was trying to figure out what to do with his life. And they're putting a book together about how to figure out what to do with your life. And I said, well, one simple thing is whatever you imagine you want to do now, go find someone who's been doing it for 10 years. They've been w working their way up the ladder and they've accomplished what you hope to accomplish 10 years from now and check out their life and see if it's what you actually think it is and see if it's what you actually want. And nine times out of 10, you're going to find out it's not. But if you find out that it is because they're just making a lot of money and you think that's the thing, then go out into the parking lot and shoot yourself in the head. First of all, I now understand why we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting here thinking, do not turn this into a six hour conversation about philosophy of life and approach to life. Keep this, keep this around business. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll do the best we can. Well, I mean, part of what you're describing, there's a phenomenon from systems theory and, and from the, the study of large complex systems. Uh, and I know this, I, I actually took a course at MIT about this, about it's called system dynamics. And it's the study of complex systems with feedback loops, things like the economy or modern life. And one of the one of the things they start off by telling you is they say one of the things you're going to learn in this class is that that almost as a rule, trying to get a complex system like your life to reach a particular outcome, you're going to correctly identify the elements that contribute to that and you are going to have exactly the wrong intuitions about what to do with them. So you're going to <laughs> pursue the wrong things, the things you think that you th the things that you think that you identify, you're going to go, oh, I need to maximize that when in fact what you need to do in some ways is minimize that. Like it, it's wild. Yeah. Well, the simplest thing is for almost anything, especially in business, if you, you know, the other thing humans do is we think that um, there's got to be just a method to get what I want. There's got to be a step-by-step -step plan somewhere. And if somebody sells you on the idea that there is, they will make a lot of money and you will spend a lot of time in hotel rooms on the weekends trying to learn that thing that probably doesn't work. And I, I remember way back when <clears throat> somebody invited me to go to Richard Branson's island and hang out with him for a week. It's going to cost some large amount of money. I said, why, why would I want to do that? They went, what? Imagine what you could learn from Richard Branson. I said, oh, I already know. They go, oh, really? What? I go, I'm not Richard Branson. And here's the kick. Neither is he anymore. He's not the guy that he started out as. And if he had to recreate what he did then, it wouldn't work because the that river has moved. You're stepping in a whole different batch of water. And people, you know, mistake that. And even worse, they look at the outliers, you know, maybe some guy who's made a bunch of money in real estate has taught a course to a million people and three of those people kind seemingly maybe maybe replicated what he did. Well, who cares? There's, you know, 900,999, whatever that number is, you know, a million minus three. Um, don't ask me to do math, <laughs> hey, um, even though I can. Uh, you know, the fact that the, the numbers don't belie the idea that, uh, or the numbers do, why can't I talk this morning, man? <laughs> the numbers seem to indicate that it doesn't really work. And in fact, if you actually really interviewed those three people who did the same thing that the teacher said, you'd probably find they weren't doing the same thing. They were doing some variation, some idiosyncratic variation that fits them, that if you ask the teacher, he would say, well, that doesn't work because I tried it. So, you know, the only thing you can do is forge your own path and cross your fucking fingers. Well, you know, I'll tell you, as someone who went to Harvard Business School and, um, you know, and so my my social circle includes a lot of extremely successful people. Um, it's been interesting because at one point I went around and I interviewed a bunch of them and I said, I basically said, what were your theories about what would, 
about what would make you happy in life or what would yeah. bring you an interesting life. And now tell me, you know, what actually happened. And almost unanimously, anyone who had an interesting life, I mean, some of them had a lot of money, but I wouldn't trade places with them for the world because, oh my God, was their life <laughs> not something I would ever want. Um, yeah. But almost without without exception, the people who were really doing the amazing, incredible, cool things, there was some point where they finally decided, fuck it, excuse me, live stream. I might have to mark this as explicit on whatever platform I'm yeah, on. Yeah, my apologies um, for, yeah, my, my stat now and now. <laughs> well, I was the one who said, but you ventriloquist, I, I, that's I, what I, was going on. I prompted you, oh, okay. I primed you. <laughs> um, but at some point they said, they said, screw it. I, you know, this other thing came up. It makes no sense it's a it's you know common sense would tell me it's a big risk and they took the risk and it worked but yeah. some of those risks you or i could look at them and go yeah and most people who take that risk are going to fall flat on their face it really is yeah. the combination of of the of the being on plan being off plan who you are and what the opportunity is you know here, here's a weird version of that um so i've been an athlete since i was seven years old and in the last however many years, especially as I've been a sprinter, I've always looked for like the, a workout plan that I could really do, a weightlifting plan, strength training plan, um, muscle building plan, especially as I'm getting older, that, that I could do. And I've tried innumerable things. <clears throat> and it was always intermittent. I mean, I've got a great home gym that I put together, so I always do something as I walk by. But I accidentally bumped into this guy named Kevin Richardson who does what he calls naturally intense, high intensity bodybuilding. If you ask people, if, if he describes what he does and you ask the average anybody who does, that's Kevin calling. If you, if you ask anyone whether his workouts make sense and work, they would tell you probably no, except A, they do if you're the right kind of person <clears throat> because his workouts take 10 minutes, three times a week. And as a lifelong athlete, I can say they are the hardest thing I have ever done every time. I mean, I have on a good week, there's only two days in the week or day and a half when I'm not sore somewhere, often everywhere. But the point is his workouts fit my personality perfectly. And for some people, they wouldn't be able to handle it. I mean, it, you, like I asked him the other day, I said, you're always telling me, you know, Hey, great work, but are you just blowing smoke up my butt? And he goes, no, no, you really work hard. You, when I, you, you push, you know, as hard as anyone I've ever seen. That's what I like to do. And I like that it's contained. And again, I'm a sprinter. I don't run distance. So put it all together. It matches my psychology and my physiology perfectly. But again, for most people, they go, yeah, that, that's complete nonsense. Who, who is this guy? I'm actually very Kevin, curious. But. Kevin Richardson, naturally intense, high intensity bodybuilding. Anyone listening, tell him I sent you. All right. Uh I probably shouldn't be stopping here to write this down in the middle of a live stream. Um, uh, so, um, so do you bring that same type of philosophy to your business? I mean, you, you say that, yeah. you, right? You... A a absolutely. Um, in fact, it's, it's problematic. One of the reasons that I, my new title is chief barefoot officer is that <clears throat> I had to pull back from my natural inclination, which is to do, I, I don't do focus very well uh, on what that means, or let me say it differently. My skill set, my psychological skill set is coming up with a whole lot of ideas and not prioritizing. That's not my skill set. So, but, um, and I go really fast. And again, I've been an internet marketer for now 32 years. So I'm really efficient at that. I'm really good at all of that. <clears throat> but as we bring in more people to the company to let the company expand, typically they're not um, as fast and not, don't have as many ideas. And it was getting overwhelming for people. So I've had to, pull back to let other people kind of step in and do what they do. And I'm not expecting them to be a hundred or 110% of what I do. If they do 80 or 90 or 70, even it's more than enough for the average company, but you know, for, to get from where we were at zero to where we got in the last year, which was just shy of $65 million. Um, you know, that doesn't happen by slow rolling things that happens by being fast, nimble, aggressive cutting. I mean, I was going to say cutting your losses. There's the thing that I say to people, many times a day when they're trying to get money from me for something where they say it's going to make me a fortune. I say, um, how quickly and cheaply can I find out if you have your head up your butt? 
because the only thing I can control is risk and everything you're promising is upside, which is completely unknowable. And don't pretend that it's not because nobody bats a thousand. No one's hitting, no one's doing a hundred percent. And I have to assume that I'm going to be one of the failures just because that's the only thing I can control. I'd be thrilled if I'm not, but I've got a plan to be. Well, in fact, you know, I would, I would, I would kind of take that a step further. One of the things that's always fascinated me and someday I actually want to do either a class or something on this is um, when I was in business school many, many years ago, there, a professor made like this offhand comment that just totally burned into my brain. He said, any deal structure is nothing but an allocation of risks and rewards. And the deal structure simply says, here are the risks that are, well, and, and actions supposedly taken. But he yeah. said, you know, here's the, here are the things that we believe we're each going to bring to the table. And depending on the different outcomes, here is how the rewards get distributed and here's how the risk gets distributed. So, for example, if you're an employee at a company, um, <clears throat> the thinking is, oh, I am giving up the upside of the value of my work in return for a nice, steady, secure paycheck. And I think as we've seen is, you know, over the last a great uh, idea. It's a great idea. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to the person who's the employer, that's great um, because their, their, their financial downside is capped. And for the employee, their insecurity downside is capped, except for the fact that these days the insecurity downside isn't necessarily capped, even in highly profitable companies, because the company decides they want their upside to be uncapped. And, and they, they, you know... Um, yeah, that you know, that's where you hope that the people that you're working for are um, human uh, and don't have the illusion that they just need more money than they could ever possibly spend in this lifetime in a handful of reincarnations. Um, and, you know, Lena, my wife and I, we are by far not the highest paid people in our company and never wanted to be. And because we want to put everything we have in the company and, you know, m make sure that it's growing and make sure that people are getting paid well we you know we pay well here's the thing that we do we have a profit sharing inspired quarterly bonus plan which means every quarter that we have a profit we take a percentage of that and it gets divided equally among everybody in the company except a couple of c-level people that they have options so they don't get that but up until then it was everybody in the company uh, and they wouldn't let me not take that bonus even though i didn't want it and <clears throat> so our people working in our warehouse they're getting bonuses. They've never seen a bonus before. People in our customer happiness team, they've never seen that before. But we know that a company requires everybody doing the best they can. And we wanted to acknowledge that. And we do it quarterly because some companies, you know, they wait till they close the year. And then in May, they're giving a bonus from what happened last year. That just doesn't work for human psychology. Uh, and, you know, we, we really wanted to make it clear that we believe everybody is important and that's one way of doing it. If you're working for a company, I mean, I, I know people where the people who are running the show are doing it just for, to maximize the amount of money in their pocket and not the way we're doing it. We're very clear. I mean, look, Lane and I, when we started the company, if someone asked us what our goal was, it was going to be, let's get a check for 5 million bucks because we had already figured out that if we had not, not a check. The check would have to be a little higher because of taxes. But we had already figured out, and this again, this is 15 plus years ago, that if we had $5 million in a suitcase under our bed, we'd never have to work again. And so that was our goal then. And the fact that there's no way we could make that quote little now hasn't really changed much. Um, mm -hmm. We'll end up with some more cash. We talked about it the other day. What are we going to spend money on? We'll do a little more traveling. I mean, we, we, we can barely imagine spending the, the money that we have now, let alone um, more. So that's echoed in how we think about our company and think about the people working for our company. Well, see, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that, you know, if you have extra money, you're going to do traveling. You should come to Burning Man with me. And you're going to say, <laughs> you're going to say, oh, I don't like the heat. I don't like the dry. And I'm going to say a wise man once told me that we're very bad at projecting what's going to make us happy. Well, um, that man was a complete idiot. I don't know who you're referring to. So um, but point well taken, Burner. <laughs> nice. Um, I. Wow, there's every th every response you give. I have like this page full of follow up questions. We're actually already at half an hour. I'm going to just go ahead and exercise moderator's privilege if you have the time to go for another few minutes. Oh, uh, I'm all yours. Okay, so we're talking about the. I mean, we got on the topic of the compensation plan um, uh, by talking about risk and reward, 
and, yeah. and the deals are, are allocations of risk and reward. You know, and you were saying that people come to you with these wonderful little business propositions in which the risk is borne by you. The money guaranteed goes to them. And so they're not really bearing the risk. And you're the one who's bearing the, the you know, they're getting a guaranteed reward and no risk. And you're getting a maybe reward, but essentially a lot of risk. I, I've fallen right. for that one many times. I'm not as wise as you are. Well, you know, no, no, no. I've fallen for it as many times as anybody else because sometimes I'm, you know, I'm wrong too. And I've said if I had a dollar for every hundred dollars that I've spent on something that I thought would work after vetting it as well as I could and it didn't work, I, we wouldn't be here because I'd still be, you know, we'd be hanging out on, on my island and Richard Branson would be paying to visit us. So um, it's not like I bat a thousand. It's simply that I definitely, I don't swing at a bunch of, uh, of wide pitches but I've definitely swung at things that I thought were in the strike zone that were wrong. And I've also um, seen a couple of things that I thought were wide and they were, they were good pitches I could have hit, but way, way fewer of those. I mean, very, very small amount of those. Sure. So if you, if, if you could go back and give your original self just starting out like advice, what are the two or three things that you found to be like kind of the most enduring and important things that oh. you, you've learned so far? That's an interesting question. Most people to say, what would you give your, what advice would you give yourself? And my answer would be, I should have gotten a government job with a pension um, <clears throat> because the lack of stress in America in particular, we really undervalue the great value of uh, reducing stress in your life. And this, this is, I say America because things like we don't have universal health care. You go to places where they do and they just don't worry about whether they can go to a doctor or not if they're injured or they've got a problem. There are places my where- My number they, one they, worry in life. That's right. Is that's, or, you know, what yeah. are you going to do when you're retired and can't work? There are places where you're taken care of and we have not experienced that. And so we just can't appreciate the unbelievable comfort uh, and lack of stress that that creates. So, but if I had to think about, you know, the things that I had to pay attention to, um, oh man, um, I'm a marketing product person. I understand finances, but I never really live in that world. And the uh, getting a, a really good understanding of cash flow because it's not how much money you make over the course of a year, it's how much money you have at your beck and call when you need it to do the things you're trying to do, including growing growing the company. Um, that would have been different. I mean, happily, my wife is a brilliant finance operations person, so I didn't need to worry too much. I would just say, here's something I want to do. And she would say, we don't have the money for that. And then my job after that was to stop whining as quickly as possible. So um, the other thing I would say uh, this is going to sound weird because I don't know how this could turn into something, but we were just really naive early on. And I, I would, I, I don't know what advice I would give myself, but we were trying to get into retail before we had any reason to be in retail. We were, we, at the, we were trying to get in retail when all we were selling was a do it yourself sandal making kit. And while it's cool and there are certain avenues for whom it's, it would be a great product. Most of the places we were going, they didn't get it and they didn't want it. Um, so we were like really naive. We spent a lot of money on things early on thinking that um, they would work. We went to trade shows thinking that we would get picked up by retailers. We weren't there. If we had been told basically wait until they reach out to you, that might have been a better play. Um, um, I'm trying to think if there's another one. I, I think this is, this is one that I didn't have to teach myself, nor did Lena, which is simply, um, how do I want to put it? Oh, boy. Uh, realize that what you're really doing for a living isn't what you're doing for a living. In other words, the biggest thing that we were doing for a living is trying to make sure we have enough money to support the growth of the company. I mean, which means constantly looking, continually looking for ways to get from where we were to where we were trying to go. Uh, and the second part that we did is just we engaged with our customers at a level that most people don't do. Lena has launches, you know, doing great customer service is easy because what most people experience is so bad. The bar is so low. It doesn't take much to, uh, to make people happy. And <clears throat> so I've just reminded ourselves that, you know, we know that and that's a good idea. I can't think of a third thing that I would have changed really. Oh, actually I have one. Um, the one thing that we didn't find the money for early enough was really, really, really high caliber talent. I mean, we lucked out and we got some great people who were brilliant, who happened to be like our first chief product officer. Uh, his previous job, he was making literally 10 times what we were able to pay him. But he joined the company because he believed in us and he believed in the product and he had just retired. Uh, 
and and it was going to be like a really interesting retirement project that turned into 10 years of his life um but had we it, it would have been smarter to try to extricate ourselves from the day-to-day -day operations of things or as many of them as we could sooner rather than later but again you know we were back to number two really naive Right, right. Well, you know, part of what you were describing there, for example, with the, with the lack of access to retail channels, given the, you know, let them come to you. Um, you know, some of that is just knowledge about the world and the way that the world works, yeah. which isn't really written down anywhere, you know, you, well, because it's contextual. Well, it, well it's kind of, I mean, it, it, it's kind of funny because in the footwear world, it is written down and ironically, it's upside down. So we didn't know what we didn't know, which is fine. Um, because we had no experience in the footwear world. But had we had experience, we would have been building the, the company to be a wholesale friendly company. And everyone that I know, except for one company that started around the time that we did that, they're out of business. Because trying to cater to the whims of retail accounts is very expensive and very and much more risky. And we had the great good fortune of starting it as, as a digitally native company. And the fact that you know I could do all that without having to pay additional people, because I could do it. Well, and you also knew that you, you could do it and pull it off and be good at it as opposed to paying people who don't do a good job at it. Well, and that's a real problem for most people. Like I, I remember talking to the head of marketing for a multi-billion dollar footwear brand and it was a weird conversation and I finally realized that I thought I knew why. So I asked him, do you know how to do any of this marketing stuff or is your job just to hire people to do it? And he goes, the latter. I said, well, then how do you know who to hire? if you don't know how to vet them by understanding deeply what they're doing. Because I can tell you, every agency that you mentioned, I've worked with and I fired them because they aren't good. Wow. I was like, that's, damn it, that's, a, that's yet another conversation. Um, well, uh, but, however, by the way, I had to learn that they weren't good. This is something, you know, some of the vetting that I now do came from early on learning, like just to get really in the weeds. I hired a company to do uh, Google, Google ads on a performance basis. And after a little while, it hit me. I said, are you making any money on anything that isn't branded, anything that isn't based on having our company name in, as a keyword? And they said, no. I said, oh, then you're fired because I can do that for free in five seconds. I don't need you for that. But so then it became a question, the kind of question that I would ask people when I would vet them um, is just getting just more specific about what they were doing uh, than I had been previously. Got it. Um Wow. Yeah. I mean, the, the, there's a whole conversation to be had about how do you vet not just not just vendors like that and agencies, but even employees. I mean, you you just mentioned you lucked in to that early employee, you know, which maybe without them, it would have been, you know, things might have gone very differently. Well, here, I'll, gi I'll give you an answer to that one really fast. There's two things. One, I love asking the following question. Um, give me three reasons to not hire you and they have to be valid reasons. And they're usually very confused. And I go, I'll give you an example. I would say. I don't do organization very well. In fact, I don't mean company organization. Like I'm not an organized person. I've got stuff all over the place, and it's hard for me to find it. Um, I have. Uh, um, I, I don't do. I don't do prioritization very well, which is a variation on the theme. And I'm a former professional stand-up comic, and stuff will come out of my mouth that's probably an HR nightmare. So give me three things, and if they can't, I'm not going to hire them because I want to see how self-aware they are. And another one, something that Lane and I have not been good at is giving people um, very explicit trial periods with very explicit goals because we've hired people who seemed like they were good on paper and through the interviews, et cetera, even if we asked them to do some work for us during the interviewing process. But it's not till you know the rubber meets the road where you can see if they really are a fit. And we have, um, on, like everybody, but we, you know, we have certainly um, brought in people who were not right for their position or for the company because we hadn't really structured something to to check that in the real world. Got it. Well, on that happy note, um, <laughs> thank you very, very much for joining me today. Uh, how can people find you um, and how can they find your shoes and your feet? Uh, well, ho hopefully just by looking online rather than stalking. But um, the easiest way to find us online is zero shoes, X E R O shoes.com. Or if you're in the EU, zero shoes.eu. Or if you're in the UK, zero shoes.co.uk. And all over social media at, uh, at zero shoes or slash zero shoes, wherever you happen to at or slash. 
Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and and uh, I hope everyone has enjoyed this interview with Stephen Sashin, and I'm almost certainly going to have him back to discuss one of the 40 topics I have on my pad at the side of my desk. I told you, I don't prioritize. <laughs> you did, and I didn't listen. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, Stephen. Cheers.